Native Cape Codder, Taisto Ranta, called Tai by his friends, was the inspiration for a documentary chronicling some of the oral history of Cape Cod. Tai's vivid memories of his childhood and growing up on Cape Cod makes for some wonderful storytelling and listening and provides an oral history that should be preserved for future generations. My dad came just before the outbreak of World War I. My mom came about three years later and she went to Ohio and they came to the Cape I would say roughly oh about the time World War I ended and they moved to Sandwich and that's where I was born. <laughs> The old schoolhouse where Ty went to elementary school still stands as the community center in West Barnstable. The church he went to with his parents still stands as it looked then. It is on Route 149 in West Barnstable and is still called the Rooster Church because of the beautiful gold weather vane on its steeple. Because he lived so close, he was asked to come in early and pump the old reed organ for services. First day of school was good, wasn't bad. We had a little lunch bucket, went there, had some milk from home and a whole bit. Good. Second day, things were going along good, but had to go to the bathroom. I didn't know how to tell how to go to the bathroom. Pretty soon, I saw a big wet spot right beside my desk. <laughs> it happened. Well, imagine this, the teacher took care of me completely. I was so embarrassed, I didn't know what to do. And, but I learned how to speak English very well, quickly. Later, he went to high school in the building that has most recently been the Hyannis Middle School. Ty remembers the experience of getting off the school bus and entering that large, impressive building. We felt as though we were going to New York City, he said. Yeah, and it was a good area of education, began to learn some of the fine things that the farming didn't teach you. It was, it was uh, enjoyable and I still remember the, the gratefulness of having had that chance. After school, there were always chores to do. I mentioned the easy ones. It was easy to carry the ashes out. That was not bad. The harder ones became weed the garden. Another hard one was lug water by the bucket to the cows and the horses. Wow, that 10 gallon bucket was two hands and you were <laughs> puffing. And boy, those cows were thirsty. <laughs> oh my God, they wouldn't stop. The other chores was weed the cranberry bog. Other chores was to, when the hay time came, that was another tough job. They put us on top of the wagon to stamp the load down so that you could put more. They'd pitchfork it up and you'd stamp the load down. That wasn't bad. But then the hay had to be put from the wagon into the hay mow in the barn. And of course it wasn't ever very cool. So you get up there and you had to stomp it into the eaves so they could get all the <laughs> hay right in there. Oh, dark, <laughs> dusty, that was fun. I remember <coughs> it was a fun job. We needed some fresh money at the house, and the folks said, "Well, you can't earn fresh money weeding the garden." So they made it arrangements with some of these adult clamors, and they took me under their wing. And believe me, what an education that was. The winters were tough. And when the bay froze over, the uh, harbor froze over, there was no digging along the shores anywhere. But in some of the places where the severity of the winter didn't freeze at all, there were open areas where the currents kept the flats quite bare. But they couldn't get out there because the ice was on the shore. So what they did, they built sleds that could hold their dory or boat 
and usually two or three men would grab a hold of that particular, their boat, drag it across the ice to the water's edge, then row across to the flat and get their daily quota. While he was still a young man, Ty joined the Navy in 1939 and served for five years. He was on the battleship the USS Texas for almost two years and then was transferred to the USS Champlin right after its launching in July 1942. There they immediately began to chase enemy submarines. It was during that time that he earned a Purple Heart. By this time he was also a married man and had a young son at home. So release from the Navy after a five-year stint was more than welcome. I did, didn't mention that I did get a little medal there. I got a Purple Heart when we bought up a German submarine with jet charges. The sub was so badly crippled that it couldn't do anything, either sink or explode if it went down to any greater depth. So it came up and it surfaced right close to the ship. Oh, I'd say it was probably, oh, 150 yards. Well, we thought this was duck soup. We was going to really blast it out. But it didn't work out that way. The German skipper was really astute, and he kept so close to us that we couldn't depress our heavy armament to do any damage. In the meantime, the skipper was still able to run his surface engines, and he was trying to circle us to get a torpedo into us. In the meantime, the deck crew was at their deck gun, and we were having a little shootout, and I got blasted a bit and they decided they ought to give me a purple hat. While I was in the service, we got married, and during one of the brief leaves in New York, uh, Mrs. Ranta came, and somewhat later by mail, I received a letter saying that I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> so <laughs> that went along fine. We uh, didn't get any mail again for a long time, but when we were shooting at that big gun in Anzio, mail caught up to us, and I found I had become a papa. <laughs> After growing up in the town of Barnstable and learning to recognize its wonderful resources, Ty, as an adult, began to take on jobs that helped to preserve them. He served as shellfish warden from 1962 until 1982, and was also the fish and game officer. This included taking care of Sandy Neck and later evolved into the job of natural resources officer. Later, he became a deputy officer of the U.S. Department of Interior. He recalls banding 500 ducks one year as part of a waterfall program and enjoyed counting those that returned after migration. For a time, he assisted in a seismic survey and learned much about the geology of Cape Cod. Later, Ty became an active beekeeper. His interest and great appreciation of these industrious creatures comes through as he cares for their hives and grows the food that they seek to produce their honey. He speaks of them with admiration and pride. I was uh, taking care of uh, two gentlemen's lawns in not far from where we lived. And they were long in their ears, but they had hive bees, hives of bees. But the chap that was taking care of them developed Parkinson's disease, and it really affected his hand. And that made beekeeping almost an impossibility because it agitated and aroused the bees. So he said, young fella, why don't you take the bees home, see what you can do. I kept the bees and things were going fairly well until World War II and came, or when I enlisted in the Navy. And the folks were not too fond of bees. No one took care of them, so that just was a springboard. I came back from the service, did work with carpentry, brought up, helped to bring up the family, keep the house going, <laughs> the usual thing. Then about the time I started the natural resources assignments, I felt bees were part of nature. 
So I took up with the bees again, and that was all oh, about 1963. And in those years, bees could be ordered from Sears Roebuck catalog or various places. And incidentally, they had some real good bees. I did very well with them. Things got from the point where the bees got to be swarming stage. And a couple of hives came to three, four, five, and things went along. So it got almost too big. And what happened in this location was a swarming. In June, or early June usually, bees swarm. And one of my hives did start to swarm. And it did swarm. They landed into this tree. And this tree is probably oh, 40, 50 feet tall. And where do you think they went? Right to the very tip. So I tried to rig up all sorts of little gimmicks to capture them or entice them to come to a bait hive or get them back to go home. Well, nothing worked. So I went to have lunch. I looked up to the tree and there they were hanging up there in a big cluster. I said, oh heavens, I'll never be able to climb this. I'm going to see what happens now. Had lunch, came back, and I walked to this spot right here. I said, I don't recall the lawn being brown here and sure and heck I looked again and there was a the whole swarm was right there on the ground it was probably about three feet long about two and a half feet wide and probably about oh I'd say three inches thick they were milling around and I was wondering why did the heaven's name did they come down uh, all at once it came to me, the queen hadn't probably been thinned down enough, or bee people call it starved enough, so that she would be eligible to fly. Usually she's in a position where she's so heavy with eggs and the workings of the mother that she cannot fly. But prior to swarming, they starve her for two weeks. So they swarmed and they got to the top of the tree. And then I came out and looked after lunch. I thought, oh heavens, now I gotta get a bait, bait hive. I placed the hive on the ground pretty much in, directly in the front end of the swarm. It was though as a military command had been given and it transmitted all through the entire length. All the bees almost did about a left face and they began to match and they matched almost in military order into the hives having bees next to people's swimming pools oh what in the heavens they don't go swimming no but they go to drink water there your bees are spoiling that pool well luckily we've been fortunate and people haven't been, been too bad about it but in some places ordinances have been created and they have to comply compile with strict laws to how far from dwellings and the whole bit a lot of interest is in beekeeping it is probably the most in-depth studied insect of any insect in the animal in the insect world their background according to the geologist, goes back three million years. So they've had a long time to protect their, <laughs> produce their environment and uh, do their thing with the environment. And they do it well. They adapt themselves to conditions very quickly. They know when it's going to rain. They know when the wind is too strong so they can't make flights. They know how to get home without any trouble. They very seldom make a mistake going into the wrong home. Once in a while they do, but they have a trick to do that. The way they do it, they'll get themselves loaded with pollen and the worker bee will come in and if you made a mistake, load of pollen, come in home, nobody cares. <laughs> they do it well. <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I just admire them. Another time-consuming activity which he carries out with his continued zeal for conservation is gardening. He plans his gardens early, starts all plants as seedlings under grow lights in the late winter months, and rotates crops with scientific know-how. 
If you don't take care of the soil, it won't take care of you, he says. In importance to us, of course the pleasure is watching things grow. The importance is that beside flowers, we grow a great deal of our own vegetables, which we put into the freezer, and it keeps us going pretty near way into the summer from each year's crop. For the other crops, the bees are unbelievable big helpers, They're invaluable. They pollinate the asparagus, they pollinate the squashes, melons, beans, lima beans, and they love to work on the broccoli flowers. They, I don't know why, but that's the yellow flower that they really enjoy after it's been harvested. I have not used any insecticides or pesticides in the entire operation. <laughs> Believe me, there's a lot of bug picking and hand weeding that has to be done. One of the reasons I do not use insecticides is that the bees would be really hurt. The other side of the coin is that we have our own well and I can't afford to pollinate or to I mean, help the water quality underground. When you live in a place for a long enough time, the overuse of fertilizers can make a pretty, pretty bad dent in the water quality. I am a little worried about the salt from the roads and of course modern times there's a lot of salt used. But the vegetable garden, I'm out here just about sun up and in the hot days it's worthwhile and I will come out in the evenings too but this is when I find that the bees are working at night. I come out there and say well you guys are busy but no overtime today. <laughs> it's not worth it. Along with a large majority of the Finnish population on the Cape, Ty built a typical Finnish sauna, which was a symbol of life back in the old country. They required much tending, and the steam that was such a wonderful source of restoration for the body was created by pouring water over superheated rocks that had been washed smooth and clean and hardened in the ocean. Winters here were severe, and the business of getting warm, having a good bath, and relieving pain was part of it. It was the way to keep healthy, said Ty. Ty has many other interests and hobbies, including boat building. Ty built his boat in 1949 and continues to use it in Barnstable Harbor. He once found a rock that he calls his lucky rock and now keeps with his boat to prop it up in storage. He said that the boat had served him well throughout these many years, but has also been used to serve the town of Barnstable. Because it has a shallow draft, it can navigate in waters that other boats can't. The police department has called him occasionally to bring his boat and help with some recovery missions. This boat was also used, Ty said with pride, to rescue three swimmers who suddenly found themselves in water over their heads when the tide came in. Yeah, one was, well, one was to, to appear. The water was up to their noses and one guy, well, we tried to pull in the boat, he had a death grip. Ty also does wood carving and has created beautiful clocks. Yeah, I, I made a lot of these and uh, I got, of course, I made this pop, not this, I'm not that type of a clock maker at all. And uh, this is uh, mahogany that came from scraps pieces from the boat yards. So it was pretty nice and it stays in shape, doggone well. And it's, again, a winter's time. It's a nice thing to be, you know, just make things and make mistakes and everything else. But see, it's done that way in the back. And, yeah, that's, that's the size of it. With all the things, honey, vegetables, apples, and we had the apples, I never sold anything at all. I gave it away. I gave the honey away every time. The bees never charged me anything. The, 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 the wood never cost me anything. So why? You know, and another thing, when you start dealing with money, 
the good fellowship disappears little by little, but it doesn't show until sometimes later, sometimes. I want my money back. Ha <laughs> ha. You're going to get it. <laughs> Ty continues to be an avid conservationist and always a pioneer of sorts. He saws and cuts and stacks the wood which he uses in the large sauna stove as well as the big stove that once heated his home. He now heats his workshop where he does a lot of his work. With a system of opening certain windows, the heat from the workshop is also directed to a kind of winter greenhouse where he hardens early tomatoes and other plants. He starts garden seedlings under grow lights in winter and stores the vegetables he raises for use throughout the year. The workshop is a place where Ty cleans and repairs his damaged beehives and builds things like window boxes. This one shaped like a dory. Oh yes, this is a sort of replica of a dory which the people in this area and other places used to row around in the Monstable Harbor. And incidentally, when I was going to school, I did quite a bit of commercial clamming myself. And this is one of the types of the vessels that we used to go clamming. Outboards went around then, and we rowed. But this is a window box, and it needs a little repair. <laughs> this time of the year, I'm renewing the bottom, and I'll have to also renew the bow stem up there. It's going to be a little bit slow in getting done with summer activities and a whole bit, so maybe the plows will have to go someplace else for a little while before I get to it. Other creations that came from Ty's workshop are a collection of beautiful, effective fishing plugs that are designed for different kinds of fish, like the big bass and bluefish. I have pretty good luck with making the plug, and they work doggone good. Uh, they're made a little different than some of the plugs that I made. And the wood here is locust that has take, come off the trees is around here that have fallen. And the reason I use that, because of its density, and it adds weight so it can be cast into the wind and stays on course. I also put a small little lead weight into the back end of the plug. So the theory in that is that when you cast it out, the lead yanks it down or pulls it down. But then when you pull with your line, you tip that and the water cups up and it makes a nice gurgly splash. Uh, the fish can yeah, the predator fish can hear that long distance, and they'll come a honking right after it pretty quickly. It, it works real well. The deer here is deer that's been shot locally. It's not been bought. And the rest of the things I usually bought from screw eyes and the whole bit, local hardware stores. And, and it's a real pleasure to be watch your snow outside and you're making plugs and turning things on the lathe. Today, Ty still lives in the house that his father helped him build in 1944, just across the West Barnstable line in Marston's Mills. He lives with his beloved wife, Betty. They have been married for 63 years. He also continues to be a shell fisherman and a man who believes in protecting the environment and doing the right thing. This includes observing rules of keeping only the legal size clams and respecting the boundaries of commercial shellfish grants. He is a generous man of high integrity and always maintains his great sense of humor. Oh, say, can you tell me the way to Route 6? <laughs> <laughs> okay.